Hello and good day. Uh, my name is Mark. I am a growth group leader at CRC and a member of the Council of Elders. Today it's my privilege to preach to you from Leviticus as part of CRC's series on God's story. I'm recording this from my home in PJ uh, during the COVID-19 restricted movement order. So apologies in advance if you hear the baby crying uh, or if the neighbor's car alarm goes off. Uh, let me begin with a memory from my childhood. Uh, growing up, I had my own room and my parents, I think, wanted to teach me to be responsible. And so they didn't tidy up my room for me. Uh, they told me it was my responsibility to keep it tidy. Uh, they told me, uh, keep it tidy yourself. This is your room. Uh, generally, my floor was covered with toys, books, uh, bits of wood, all sorts of things. Uh, there were paths across the room, uh, but it was a bit like a jungle trek as you went across the room. Now, every once in a while, I'd have a friend or a cousin come to stay over and uh, I'd need some space on the floor for them to sleep. Uh, so I'd need to push all the stuff away. I'd grab a whole bunch of the stuff and then I'd just shove it into a cupboard and then carefully close the door and hope that nothing would fall out as I was doing it. Now, this is clearly not an episode of tidying up with Marie Kondo. Now, fast forward a few decades, and as an adult with a household of my own, I am a little better. But whenever we have guests coming over, uh, there comes a point, usually about 10 minutes before the guests arrive, when I just chuck the rest of the stuff that I didn't manage to sort out into a room where the guests won't see it. Now, I tell this story because this is similar to how many people think about preparing to meet God. Think about it this way. If you got a text from God and it said, I'm coming over to your house. I'm going to be there in 15 minutes. How would you react? How would you feel? What would you need to do to get ready for God coming to visit you in your house? Now, this is the concern of Leviticus and is addressing it for Israel. God has said in Exodus 29:45. I will dwell among the people of Israel, right? This is God saying, I'm going to come over to your house. And the question is this, how are they going to be ready as a people for God to come and live with them? Now, Leviticus addresses this in two ways. One, how is God going to dwell with a people who are sinful? And then two, how should the people live if they have a holy God in their midst, right? When God's address is your house address, when God lives with you, what kind of life should you live? Now we're going to do these two things over two weeks. So this week we're going to look at how can God dwell with a sinful people. And then next week we're going to look at what kind of lives these people should live if they have a holy God who is dwelling with them. Now my aim for you this week is that as we look at Leviticus, you would see how holy God is, then you will see how seriously he takes sin, and then you would come to take God's holiness and your, your sin that seriously as well. And therefore, as you come to do this, that you will come to repent of your sin and then to flee to Christ as your only hope of being made acceptable to God through the cross. Now, with that aim, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing your great plan of salvation through your word. We thank you for teaching your church from Genesis and Exodus. And we pray for our time this week and next week in Leviticus. We pray, Father, that you would open our eyes, that we might behold wondrous things from your law. Show us your glorious holiness, the wretchedness of our sin, and your great grace in Christ. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, please turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus comes as part of an ongoing story of God's holy love and his rule over his elect people and his defeat of all who threaten this so that his people might serve him as he deserves. Uh, this is the definition that we worked out in the fourth sermon of this series, the Sermon on the Kingdom of God. Uh, if you missed it, you can catch up on our website crt.com.my. Now Leviticus tells us in chapter 1 verse 1 
that this is a book of a record of what God said to Moses at the tent of meeting. These instructions to Moses cover a period of one month. Uh, the start of it is recorded for us in Exodus 40, and then you see the end of it in Numbers 1. So Exodus 40 verse 1, On the first day of the first month you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Verse 17, In the first month in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. So that's the beginning time marker. And then you find the end in Numbers 1 verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tent of meeting, on the first day of the second month, in the second year, after they had come out of the land of Egypt. And then follows the book of Numbers. So these two references bracket the timeline for us in Leviticus, and they show us that this period of instruction is over one month. Now we've seen one connection already with Exodus, right? The setting up of the tabernacle that's mentioned in Exodus 40. Uh, but let's now look more broadly at the connection and the backdrop that Exodus gives us for Leviticus. Exodus is the story of God's victory over Pharaoh and his rescue of his people from slavery to serve him. Uh, as we saw in the song in Exodus chapter 15 verse 1, uh, when David preached to us, God had triumphed gloriously over the Pharaoh. Exodus 15, 14, all the nations around have heard of this and then they tremble. Verse 15, their chiefs are dismayed. Verse 16, terror and dread have fallen upon them. And because of the greatness of God's arm, right, His great might in displaying and displayed in how He triumphs over Pharaoh, these nations are all in awe of God. Uh, Israel is now God's possession and He has purchased them. Verse 16, and having brought them out, he now says he will bring them to his mountain and plant them there. Verse 17. So God brings uh, Israel, the congregation of Israel, to Mount Sinai, and his presence then descends onto the mountain. Exodus 19 verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. See, God's people, they're gathered around the mountain and His presence has descended on the mountain and He is now in their midst. Moses goes up to meet the Lord and this is when God gives Moses the law, uh, Exodus 20 to 24, uh, beginning with the Ten Commandments and then the instructions for building the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 25 all the way to 40. So, what we have in Exodus is, from chapter 20 onwards, is God constituting Israel as a nation and ruling over them. Uh, you can see that in the way that Exodus 20 verse 1 starts. Right? Exodus 20 verse 1, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And then by the end of Exodus, the tabernacle has been built, and we get to Exodus 40 verse 34 to 36, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So, Exodus has taken us from God's people gathered around His mountain, right, and His glory has descended on it in Exodus 19, then giving of the law and instructions of the tabernacle, and in, in Exodus 40, the tabernacle is built, and then the, the presence of the Lord now descends on the tabernacle. Right, so we've gone from mountain with God's presence to tabernacle with God's presence. And this marks a new stage in Israel's story as a nation. Leviticus 1 verse 1 picks up right here where Exodus 40 ends with God's presence filling the tabernacle. Uh, you can also note a striking literary parallel between the end of Exodus and the start of Leviticus 1 uh, with what has happened in Exodus 24. So you can see in Exodus 40, right, the, the tabernacle is built and then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And Leviticus 1 verse 1, the law called to Moses. Okay, so that's the end of Exodus and the first verse of Leviticus. And then you have a matching set of uh, verses in Exodus 24. Exodus 24 verse 16a, the cloud covered Mount Sinai. And Exodus 24 16b, the Lord called Moses to Moses. Now this is noteworthy because it's the only other occurrence of this phrase and the Lord 
called to Moses. Right? That's, you only find it in Exodus 24, 16 and Leviticus 1 verse 1. And the setting mirrors Exodus 24 with the presence of the Lord descending. What is different? Well, in Exodus 24, it is the Lord's presence descending on the mountain. And then in Exodus 40, it is the Lord's presence descending on the tent of meeting. So you see the author, he is making an intentional parallel between these two events. Of course, with the development, right? So it's gone from mountain to tabernacle. Uh, and you see here, God has chosen a new address. Uh, this, of course, points very clearly to a unity between Exodus and Leviticus. Uh, you don't see it in your English translations, but Leviticus 1 verse 1 in Hebrew starts not with the Lord, but with a conjunction and. Right? So in Hebrew, Leviticus 1 verse 1 says, And the Lord called to Moses. Now this way of starting the book is not only true of Leviticus, actually Exodus starts this way as well as Numbers. So you can see on the slide that the first word of each of these three books, right? Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers starts with an and. And this is indicative of how we should read these books, right? We should read them together with Genesis and as a unit. And as we chart the development of the storyline, Exodus has presented us already with a pressing concern because Israel has demonstrated again and again that the people are sinful and impure. As Leviticus 16.16 16 puts it, the people are unclean because of their transgressions and their sins. Now think back to what David showed us from Exodus. Right, right after they had been graciously rescued from Egypt, from slavery, they crossed the Red Sea, and then in the very next chapter, chapter 15, they begin grumbling against Moses. And then in chapter 16, they grumble again. They say, 16 verse 3, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And then the next chapter, chapter 17, the people grumble again and they say, verse 3, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? And on and on it goes. And then you get to Exodus 32 with the golden calf. Right? As Moses is up on the mountain receiving the law from the Lord, the people are down below fashioning an idol. So Exodus, it sets God's sovereign grace in saving Israel in stark contrast to the sinfulness and impurity of the people. Right? The pressing question is, how can God be present with them if they are like this? Now, this is where Leviticus comes in. Leviticus is God's gracious means for dealing with the sin and impurity of Israel so that he can dwell in their midst. Exodus shows us the problem and Leviticus gives us God's gracious provision. So this narrative is begun in Genesis, telling us how the rebellion of man began. And then it follows the increasing sinfulness of man with Cain killing Abel, with the Tower of Babel, with Noah, uh, all the way up to Abraham. And it's against this backdrop that God promises to Abraham in Genesis 12 that he will begin a new people from Abraham, a people who will be set apart for the Lord. As Genesis 17, 8 says, I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, these descendants of Abraham are to be set apart as God's people. They are to be distinct from the rest of the world that is fallen and in rebellion against God. So we have these theological foundations for Leviticus from Genesis and from Exodus. Right? We have the fall of man and his sinfulness on the one hand, and then we have God's gracious initiative in creating a holy people through Abraham on the other. Now, as we see how tightly these books are all integrated, it shows us that the author intends us to read them and to understand them together. Right? These books, together with Numbers, are a cohesive narrative that track the fulfillment of these promises to Abraham. Right? The gathering of the people in Exodus, the giving of the law in Exodus and in Leviticus, and then the conquest of the land in the book of Numbers. 
So Leviticus is the working out of God's covenant promises. Right? His commitment to make a way for his sinful people to be made acceptable to him by atoning for their sin and then instructing them to live lives that are reflective of his own holiness. Uh, we see God's desire to commune with man. Right? This God who walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. The God who in the dark hour of Genesis 3 promised a serpent crusher. The God who made gracious promises to Abraham, who saved Noah from destruction. The God who provided in Genesis 22 a substitute for the sacrifice of Isaac. This is the sovereign God who, though he doesn't have to, graciously makes a way for sinners to be reconciled to him. So Leviticus is the working out of this covenant commitment. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now don't be deceived by the English name of Leviticus, which is from the Greek and means things concerning the Levites. Right? This is not just a book about the Levitical priests. It is about God's gracious provision and his initiative to make a sinful people his people. So we come to Exodus 29:45. I will dwell among the people of Israel. Right? God's saying to Israel, I'm coming over to stay at your place. Now Exodus has shown us the problem, right? How can God dwell with these people when they are sinful and impure? Right? When they show that their loyalty is not to God, but is instead to their own stomachs. Uh, Leviticus, therefore, is God's provision to make this work. At the center of the book of Leviticus is chapter 16, with the Day of Atonement. Uh, and this divides the book into two halves. Right? And this, you can see on the slide, is how the first half, chapter 1 to 16, is la laid out. So Leviticus begins with the five major offerings in chapter 1 to 6. You have the burnt, grain, peace, sin, and guilt offerings. And then after that, you have God's instructions to the priests on how to handle these offerings in chapters 6 and 7. And then you get chapters 8 to 10, which gives us a narrating of the ordination of the first priests. You got the first tabernacle service, and then the deaths of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu in chapter 10. This is followed by chapter 11 to 15, which gives a series of laws on ritual cleanness. Right? These cover food, childbirth, skin disease, and bodily discharge. And then chapter 16, it brings it all to a climax with the Day of Atonement for all the uncleannesses of the people because of their iniquities and their sins. Now this section, Leviticus 1 to 16, as a whole, is driven by God's holiness. Leviticus 11, 44 to 45, For I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground, for I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Now it is glorious and it is exciting to have God among His people. Right? And Leviticus 1-16 to is about making this possible. Chapter 1-6 to has instructions for five types of offering, burnt, grain, peace, sin, and guilt offerings. Uh, and these offerings are typically from either the herd or the flock. Right? They're either a bull or a ram. Although you do get concessions for those who are not able to afford the more costly offerings. Now when an animal was brought as an offering, it was important that this animal was without blemish. It was to be one as far as possible physically perfect. Now we can divide these offerings into two subgroups. So the first three of the offerings, they are voluntary sacrifices. They're offered to God and uh, without any particular reason. Uh, these are the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the fellowship offerings. And then the second group are what we call the obligatory offerings. These are offerings that are required when an Israelite has broken or violated one of the laws from God. These are the sin and guilt offerings. Uh, this distinction between the two groups is borne out as well as you read uh, about them. The first group are described as being a pleasing aroma to the Lord, whereas the second group, uh, the effect is described as the offerer being forgiven. Right? That's how we divide these two groups. These instructions are given uh, in the order of burnt, grain, peace, 
sin and guilt in Leviticus 1 to 6. But one thing to notice is that when they are performed, you find that the sin offering comes first. So for example, in the ordination of the priests in chapter 8, it is the sin offering and then the burnt offering and the ordination offering. Also in chapter 9, when Aaron and his sons make the offering for themselves, they start with the sin offering, then the other offerings. Same thing when they do the offerings for the people. And then in chapter 16, with the Day of Atonement, again it's the sin offering first and then the burnt offering. Now this priority in the sin offering shows us the key role that it played in making provision for dealing with the uncleanness of the people. So let's focus on uh, this sin offering in Leviticus chapter 4. Uh, so turn to Leviticus chapter 4 with me uh, and you'll see that this section is, uh, comprises five subsections. Okay, these deal with the high priest, the congregation, uh, ruler, the individual, and then the sins of omission. The first four deal with sins that have been committed when they did something that the law had forbidden. Right, these are sins of commission. And then the fifth section in chapter 5 deals with sin where the person has failed to do what was actually required of them. Now these offerings all have much in common with them. So we'll just take one example in chapter 4 verse 13 to 21 with the offering for the inadvertent sins of the congregation. So looking at verse 13 and 14, uh, once the sin is known, the guilt is realized, then the congregation is to bring a bull to the front of the tent of meeting. Then verse 15, the elders are to lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord and then the bull is killed. The blood of the bull is then brought by the priest into the tent of meeting. It is sprinkled before the Lord seven times in front of the veil and then some of that blood is put on the horns of the altar and the rest of the blood is poured at the base of the altar. Then you get the fat of the animal and that is burnt and, and this way atonement is made for the sins of the congregation, verse 20, and they shall be forgiven. And then at the end, the rest of the bull is taken outside the camp and burnt. Now this animal that is dying here is dying symbolically in the place of the people. Right? Verse 15, the elders of the people, they represent the people and they put their hands on the head of the animal, identifying the sinners with the animal, and then the animal is killed. Right? As Leviticus 17 verse 11 tells us, this is necessary for there must be shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. Leviticus 7, 17 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is in the blood that makes atonement by the life. See, blood here is symbolic for life and thus the shedding of blood speaks of the death of the animal in the place of the offerer. This here is the means that God provided so that He could dwell in the midst of a sinful people. Right? This priority for the atonement of sin, you find it's not only restricted to the sin offering, in fact even the burnt offering, while the emphasis is on total dedication to the Lord, Leviticus 1 verse 4 makes clear that the sacrifice of the bull also makes atonement for the one bringing the offering. So the first part of God's provision in Leviticus chapter 1 all the way to 6 verse 7, we have the instructions for the offerings. Uh, these are given from the point of view of the worshipper, the one bringing the offering. And then we go into chapter 6 verse 8 to chapter 7 with instructions for the priests. Uh, these are given from the point of view of the priest on how to carry out these offerings. Uh, as you can see, God is not leaving anything to chance. His instructions are thorough and they are clear. And as we read it, this is uh, something that should show us the grace of God in the details of each verse in these chapters. Right? God is not being long-winded. Right? He is taking good care of His people. Now after chapter 7, uh, Instructions to the Priests, we have a section of narrative that recounts the ordination of Aaron and his sons as priests and then the events of the first temple service. Uh, in 8 verse 1, Moses calls Aaron his brother and uh, his sons who serve as priests and he gathers the congregation of Israel. Aaron and his sons are then washed and dressed as God has instructed in Exodus 29. And then Moses anoints them and the tabernacle in verse 10. And then he performs the sin offering and the burn offering and the ordination offering for Aaron and his sons. Now once this is complete, in Leviticus 9 verse 1, Aaron and his sons, they make an offering 
as the Lord has instructed, a sin offering first, verse 3, then a burnt offering, verse 3, and also a peace offering, verse 4. Now this is a, a time of great excitement because the Lord is about to manifest His glory to Aaron and his sons and the congregation. Right, right before their eyes, they will see God dwelling in their midst. See Leviticus 9, verse 6 and 7. And Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, Draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourselves and for the people and bring the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord has commanded. Now Aaron does as he is instructed, together with his sons. They make this offering and then the offering for themselves first and for the people. And then Leviticus 9 verse 22 to 24. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and he blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. See, God's glory is right there before them. And they are filled with awe and joy. See, verse 24 in the ESV just says they shouted and fell on their faces. But the Hebrew word, and the, this idea here is shouting for joy. And so the NIV translates it as fire came out and when the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. See, God's provision means that their sin can be atoned for and that His glory can be manifested in their midst. And this is the cause of the people's joy, that their Lord is with them. Now, chapter 10, as we move past chapter 9, highlights the same grace of God, but it does so from the negative. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Two of Aaron's sons, right? Nadab and Abihu. They've been part of the temple service in chapter 9 and the manifestation of the glory of the Lord and the joy of the people. And they decide to approach God on their own. They take fire, they put incense on it. And Leviticus, Leviticus describes this as unauthorized fire. This is an offering that is not in accordance with the instructions from the Lord. And the result is instant death. Now, this shows us, right, Leviticus 1 to 9, with all its instructions on offerings, and the priesthood, it shows us how this is so vital. Right? God has made a way for His people to be with Him. Chapter 10, with the death of the sons of Aaron, shows you, you really need God's provision. Chapters 1 to 9. Now, if you read this story, and maybe your response was, wow, God is really a stickler for rules. Right? It's like a government department. If you didn't bring uh, 16 copies of the right document, they send you home. Now, if that was your response, then you don't really get what's going on in Leviticus. You need to see that Nadab and Abihu, their death here, is not the most shocking thing in Leviticus chapter 8 to 10. Right? Two sinners approaching God on their own, a holy God, and dying, that is not really a surprise. Now, what is the most shocking thing in Leviticus 8 to 10? It's not chapter 10. It is chapters 8 and 9. Right? That sinful men like Moses and Aaron can approach God and survive. Right? In Leviticus 9 verse 23, Moses and Aaron, they go into the tent of meeting and they come out alive. Right? In 9 verse 24, when the fire comes down, it only consumes the offering and it doesn't consume the people. You see, that is the amazing thing in Leviticus 8 to 10. And that is what Leviticus 1 to 16 is all about. God providing a way for him to dwell in the midst of a sinful people. Chapter 10 here with Nadab and Abihu show you what would happen without God's provision. Right? Apart from this provision, the default result when unholy meets holy is that unholy is destroyed. You see, when God is in your midst, if you're not holy, you're dead. Now, if you didn't read Leviticus 10 this way, then I want to ask you, why not? Right? Why was your response Wow, God is very particular about His rules. 
You see, part of the problem could be that your God isn't really that holy or that sin is not really that sinful. Right? To you, maybe Genesis 3 is as true uh, just as a concept, but you haven't really appropriated it as reality. Leviticus 10 is teaching us here that sin is not just an idea. Right? Sin is real and it is deadly. Right? God's holiness isn't just something that we sing about in songs. God's holiness is potentially a very threatening reality. You see, when God is in your midst, if you're not holy, then you're dead. Now, this is the problem of Exodus 29:45, right? I will dwell among the people of Israel. It is the problem of Genesis 17:8. I will be their God. Now, I will be their God and I will dwell among them is a wonderful thing, but it's also a terrifying thing, right? To belong to God, that is amazing. That is a great privilege. But it's also potentially a great danger if you are unholy. And so that is where Leviticus chapter 1 to 16 fits. Right? It is concerned with God providing a means for him to dwell with Israel. Now together with this sacrificial system, God also gives the people laws for ritual cleanness. Uh, these laws are in Leviticus chapters 11 to 15. Uh, they are anticipated in chapter 10, verse 10 and 11, where God says to Aaron the high priest, you are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. And you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them by Moses. Uh, this here is part of the job description of the Old Testament priest to distinguish between holy and common, clean and unclean. And the laws that we get in chapter 11 to 15, they provide the rule for what is clean and unclean. Uh, we know why these laws were given. Chapter 11, 45, 44 and 45 that we read just now. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. See, because God is this holy God, Israel are to be a people who visibly bear that name, who display their separation in maintaining ritual cleanliness. See, the focus here is on them as a people. It's not just about me being clean before God. It's about them as a people being set apart for the Lord. They cover food, birth, skin diseases, and bodily discharges. And when we read them, uh, we're not to equate ritual uncleanness automatically with sinfulness. Uh, many of the things that make you ritually unclean in Leviticus are not sinful activities, right? Like giving birth um, or sexual intercourse within marriage. So now, if these laws are not about moral rightness, what was the logic behind them? Uh, why were some animals clean and others unclean? Why was childbirth defiling? Uh, this is a perpetually difficult question to answer because Leviticus doesn't explain the reason behind the distinction. Uh, many explanations have been offered by the commentators. Uh, some of them are quite convincing. I'll tell you my uh, preferred one in a minute. But ultimately, what makes something unclean was that God had said, this is unclean. Right? Why was Israel not to eat camel meat? Well, ultimately, because God has said, don't eat camel meat. It's not something that's intrinsic about camel meat that was bad. Uh, that is why in the New Testament, in Acts 10, God can declare all things clean, presumably without altering the biological structure of camel meat. Right? Uh, what is making it clean or unclean ultimately is God's word about these foods. Uh, this echoes Genesis 1 and 2, where Adam and Eve were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because God had told them not to eat of it. I mean, the fruit itself was perfectly edible. It wasn't poisonous. The reason, though, it was off limits was because this is God's world and we are to live by His word, not by what appeals to our eyes. So also in Leviticus, right? Camel meat might be biologically fine for you, but Israel was to demonstrate her loyalty to God and obedience to His word by eating only what God declared as clean. So in this way, in distinguishing clean from unclean, God was placing a line around His people and separating them from all the nations around them. 
right? It allowed them to be obviously and evidently separate, right? To eat different, to dress different, to plant different, to worship different, to be a distinct people. Now the role of the priest was to teach people God's law and then to distinguish between clean and unclean, holy and unholy. And as a quick application, Christians, uh, 1 Peter 2.9 tells us that we are called to be a royal priesthood. And so one of our roles now is to distinguish, like they did, between clean and unclean, holy and unholy in our own lives. As a Christian, we are not to be like the world that views life materialistically. Right? The world that looks at the fruit and says, this fruit looks good, looks appealing to the eyes. Instead, we are to be ones who live by God's word. You see, the world has a moral design to it, one that is determined by God, the designer. And so you are to keep your life pure, as 1 Peter 1.15 expects, right? because you are the fulfillment of this priesthood. Right? These laws in Leviticus, therefore, are a great opportunity for us to reflect on our own hearts. Right? Do we seek God and His holiness in an unclean world? Matthew 5, 8 tells us only the pure in heart will see God, right? This holiness and purity of God's people is what Christ died for. Hebrews 10, verse 10. And so I would call on you to repent if you have in your life as a Christian taken lightly the holiness that Christ died for. We must not be those who live according to what appeals to our eyes and to our hearts, but instead be those who live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So is there a logic we've been asking to clean and unclean in Leviticus? Um, I find that the symbolic explanation is the most convincing one. This is an explanation that says uncleanness is determined by association with sin, the fall and death. Uh, the obvious kind of uncleanness that this explains is from touching dead bodies and skin diseases, right? clear links to Genesis 3. Uh, for food laws, we find that carnivorous birds are unclean, and that you could explain because they eat dead animals. Um, of course, this explanation doesn't fully and neatly answer all the questions because it doesn't give you an explanation for why camels, let's say, are unclean or pigs. Uh, but this isn't a question that Leviticus tries to answer, and so uh, it's okay if we can't be conclusive about this logic. This symbolic explanation, though, uh, does seem quite plausible for many of the sorts of ritual uncleanness and it is a pretty helpful one because it gives you a link between uncleanness and unholiness. Right? Although being ritually unclean doesn't mean that you have sinned, it does provide a metaphor for sin. It gives you a constant reminder as God's people that you are to be holy to the Lord. Right? Leviticus 24, 24 to 26, But I said to you, you shall inherit their land and I will give, you, give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourselves detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. You see, approaching God is to be done on His terms. Uh, the Israelite worshipper was not to participate in sacrifice while they were ceremony, ceremoniously unclean because God is holy. God and His worship were to be kept separate from uncleanness. Leviticus 15.31 Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleannesses, lest they die in their uncleannesses by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. Now this was no light matter. Uh, just imagine, if you will, the horror of waking up one morning and discovering on your arm a whitening of the skin. Right? Imagine having to go to the temple and to present yourself before the priest to be examined and to be investigated and then to realize that as long as you are afflicted by this disease, you would have to be kept away from God and His worship. And imagine then the relief once his skin condition cleared and the joy of being pronounced clean and being able once again to participate in the temple worship of the Lord. 
So Leviticus 1 to 15, it gives us God's provision for the problem of a holy God dwelling among Israel. Right? You have the temple sacrifice and these laws of ritual cleanness. But all these offerings and the observance of the ritual cleanness, they come to a climax in chapter 16 with the Day of Atonement. In fact, without chapter 16, the regular offerings and the rituals would all fall flat. As Leviticus 16 and 16 shows, even after all the regular offerings throughout the year, the sins of the people would still pollute the holiness of the tabernacle. Leviticus 16 and 16, speaking about the offering done by the high priest, it says, Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleannesses of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleannesses. Now this Day of Atonement, this was the most solemn of all Old Testament rituals. And it was unique because on that one day of the year, one man, the high priest, was allowed to pass through the veil and enter into the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies. 16, 2 and 3, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So on that day, Aaron was to put on special linen clothes and to wash himself before beginning. And then for himself, he would have to bring a bull and a ram. And then for the congregation, verse 5, he would bring two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So these offerings on the Day of Atonement there were sin offerings and burnt offerings, right? For, uh, for the priests, for the high priest, a bull and a ram. And then for the people, a bull and two goats. So the bulls here, these were the burnt offerings. as an expression of dedication to the Lord. And then the ram and the two goats, these were sin offerings. Now what was unique about the sin offerings uh, here in chapter 16 are the two goats. So chapter 16 verse 7, Then he shall take the two goats, set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement for it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. So first, the high priest would go in and he would make atonement for himself, verse 11. And then he would kill the goat of the sin offering for the people and then make atonement for the holy place because of the defilement of the people and their sin. Then he would do the same for the tent of meeting and for the altar to cleanse them from the uncleannesses of the people. So up to verse 19, the high priest has killed the ram and one of the goats as sin offerings for himself and for the people. Then verse 20, the live goat. Verse 20, uh, when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting in the altar, he shall present the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat free in the wilderness. This part of the Day of Atonement is unique. Uh, you don't find instruction on this in any of the preceding chapters. Uh, you see the live goat, he's brought to the high priest and instead of putting just one hand on the head of the goat, as is done with the other animals in the earlier chapters, he puts both his hands on the head of the goat and then he confesses all the iniquities of the people, their transgressions and their sins. These iniquities, transgressions and sins are then transferred to the goat who bears, bears them on itself and removes them out of the camp. Right? The goat is taken out into the wilderness and this is to preserve the holiness of the camp because that is where God is dwelling. There has to be a complete separation from this goat that is bearing the sins of the people. Verse 26, even the man who brings the goat out of the camp, when he comes back, he has to wash his clothes and bathe his body before coming into the camp. Now this removal of all that is unholy is what must happen if God is going to dwell among the people of Israel. Right? This unholiness is accumulating day after day in the camp. 
and each year it has to be removed from their midst. In this way, God who is holy can continue to dwell in the midst of the people. Now once this is done, the high priest then returns to the tent to complete the ritual. Verse 24, he bathes again, changes his clothes and then continues with the burnt offerings. First his burnt offering and then the burnt offering for the people. So we see Leviticus 16 has this central role in the book of Leviticus because as far as the Old Testament goes, it is the ultimate means of atoning for the sins of the people and separating them from that sin so that God can dwell in their midst. Right? This is to be an annual event for them. And the whole nation is to identify with this sacrifice by stopping their work, verse 31, and afflicting themselves. And in this way, Leviticus 16.33, He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting, and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests, and for all the people of the assembly. And this shall be a statute forever for you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in a year because of all their sins. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. Now as we come to the New Testament, we find that this provision in Leviticus for his people to dwell with him is central to the understanding of the person and the work of Christ. Paul, for example, uses the imagery of a burnt offering from Leviticus 1 to describe Christ's sacrifice as a fragrant offering, Ephesians 5 verse 2. He uh, uses the same language to speak of the generosity of the Philippians then in Philippians 4, 1 to 8. The idea of the sin offering is also used powerfully to explain Christ's death. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, for example, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This speaks of how Christ is the one onto whom our sin is transferred, just as on the Day of Atonement, the high priest put both his hands on the goat, confessed the sins of the people, and transferred them to their goat. Now, nevertheless, uh, while the Day of Atonement is this high point in Leviticus, in all of Old Testament temple worship, the book of Hebrews teaches us that even the Day of Atonement fell short of achieving its objective. So Hebrews 10 verse 1, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they have not ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So the Levitical law is a shadow of the good things to come. Right? These good things, they refer to the coming of Christ. 10 verse 5 shows us that. Now in what way does Leviticus foreshadow the person and work of Christ? Well, we've seen Leviticus stressed the importance that the animals being offered were without blemish, right? as physically perfect as possible. Hebrews 10 though shows us that the point was never a perfect animal. Right, as if an animal could bear the sins of a man. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. A man's death, not an animal's death. What was needed was a perfect man, one who was pleasing to God in every way, one who perfectly did God's will. Right? No animal could bear the wrath of God against sin and satisfy that wrath. So Hebrews 10 verse 10, ultimately we see it is through the offering of the body of Christ, the perfect obedient son, that we can be sanctified. Only He is of sufficient value to die as a substitute for the sins of man. Eschatologically, how will God dwell among His people? It is when they are once for all fully sanctified through the perfect offering of the body of the Lamb. And because He is this perfect sacrifice, He is also the final sacrifice. Right? Leviticus provides instructions for the daily, weekly, annual sacrifices, but this repetition is only necessary because of their ineffectiveness. Hebrews 10 verse 11, Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. See, these sacrifices were ordained for a period in the history of Israel as a means for dealing with sin, so that God might dwell with the people. But an animal can't... Uh, can never substitute for a man. 
right? The offerings, therefore, in Leviticus themselves were not effective. And so, you see, they had to be offered again and again and again. What they were anticipating, though, is one final sacrifice. Hebrews 10 verse 12. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. See, the repetition of Leviticus shows us the inadequacy of the animal sacrifice and our desperate need for an effective sacrifice. So Leviticus highlights for us the problem of sin and points us towards the fulfillment, the solution. But the sacrifices of Leviticus, its priests, its tabernacle, they were never able to fully atone for sin. As Hebrews 9 verse 11 points out, the tabernacle in Israel was merely a copy of the greater and more, heaven, more perfect heavenly tent. 9 verse 23, since the tabernacle in Israel was an inferior copy of the heavenly one, it could be purified with the blood of animals, but the heavenly dwelling of God can only be purified by a better sacrifice than the blood of animals. And because Christ has made this sacrifice of himself, Hebrews 9.26, sin is fully and finally put away. Right? Just as that scapegoat in Leviticus 16 bore the sins of the people on itself out of the camp, so also Christ as the perfect sin offering puts sin away. Hebrews 13, 11 and 12. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So also Jesus suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. John the Baptist echoes this understanding. John 1, 29, when he exclaims about Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Leviticus foreshadows for us the work of Christ in bearing our sins away from us so that we might be made holy. And not only does Leviticus anticipate the need for a perfect sacrifice, uh, but it also shows us the need for a perfect high priest. So Leviticus 16, on the Day of the Atonement, one of the indicators that the law was a shadow is the need for the high priest to offer sacrifices for himself. You know that you've got a problem, right, when the one who is representing you to God is himself beset with weakness and sin, right? That he needs to offer his own sin offering. So Hebrews 7, 26 and 27, it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily for his own first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself. So Leviticus begins to answer the problem of how a holy God can dwell among an unholy people, but only in Christ do we see how sin and uncleanness will fully and finally be dealt with. And thanks be to God, he has provided an offering for sin so that we might be in fellowship with him and dwell with him for all eternity. Right? In Leviticus, the high priest, he, goes, he went into the Holy of Holies once a year, one man going in once a year. But when Christ died, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom because full and final atonement had been made such that those who are covered by the blood of Christ have access and can boldly approach the throne of God. Now, what is there uh, for us as Christians to reflect on from Leviticus. Here are five points of theological reflection to start with. Uh, first of all, Leviticus shows us a God who is totally holy. Right? For God to be holy means that He is separate from sin, separate from uncleanness. Uh, His holiness is emphasized for us in Leviticus in the bloody sacrificial offerings, in the minutiae of the law, uh, in the death of Nadab and Abihu. And what Leviticus does is that it forces us to deal with the holiness of God not as a concept, but as a concrete reality that shows us how the world was supposed to be. Right? Leviticus gives us a very real concept of God's holiness. Uh, it also highlights for us the sinfulness of man. Uh, Genesis 3 is not just a theoretical thing in Leviticus, 
uh, when Aaron sons, if you don't take the holiness of God seriously and sin seriously, you end up dead. Right? The fact that sin means death is a daily reality in Leviticus. Right? Every day at the temple, you have animals being killed, you have their blood being poured out, because sin is really real. Right? In Leviticus, you are to look at the thousands of liters of blood that is poured out and the countless animals that die. And you should see that that is you. You're, you're supposed to be the one dying. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. It, if you're not holy, then it shows you you're supposed to be dead. So read Leviticus. And each time you read of an animal being killed, say to yourself, that should be me. Right? When you doubt the seriousness of sin, go read Leviticus and think about the blood that was shed. And then think, all that blood still didn't satisfy God's wrath against sin. And as your realization of the holiness of God grows and your conviction of your own sinfulness increases, Leviticus should magnify the graciousness of God. Leviticus reveals to us a God who graciously provides a way for Him to dwell among His people without consuming them. Leviticus is God vindicating His righteousness as He separates His people out from a rebellious world that is headed for destruction. Without Leviticus, it wouldn't just be Nadab and Abihu who were destroyed. Right? This grace of God in providing a way to cleanse people from their sins, that is not a New Testament idea that began with the coming of Christ. This is a consistent theme that began in Genesis 22 as God provided a substitute for Isaac, and then a theme that Leviticus expounds in detail. All the Levitical laws for ritual cleanness and all the sacrifices, they show God's gracious initiative to save and to sanctify a people for himself. Right? We learn of a God who sovereignly defines holiness and then just as sovereignly provides the means for sinners to be saved. Right? Salvation is on God's terms. It is a salvation from his wrath and it is also by his appointed means right? for his, and also for his appointed purposes. Right? In God, there is no conflict or tension between holiness and mercy. Right? There's no tension between the hatred for sin and grace shown to his elect. As Exodus 15, 11 to 13 exclaims, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, you have swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you've redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. Now, if God is holy, if, God is, uh, if man is sinful and we are unable to even approach God, right? if God is this sovereign God who plans and accomplishes salvation, then we must proclaim with Peter in Acts 4 verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Right? Salvation is through Christ alone. All other attempts to reach up to God are doomed to fail. And they are an insult to God and His Son. Now if today you have realized for the first time God's surpassing holiness and the depth of your sinfulness, right? if you can see now that on that final day when you approach God, your fate will be that of Nadab and Abihu, then let me appeal to you with the graciousness of God that we have seen in Leviticus. Leviticus speaks to us of a God who desires to save sinners and who does so without any compromise of His holiness and without diminishing the sinfulness of sin in any way. Right? This is the God who gave His Son, Jesus, to be the fulfillment of all Leviticus offerings so that sinners like you and like me might be, have our sins atoned for, so that we might be fully cleansed from all our sins. And so I appeal to you, cast yourself therefore on the mercies of God and put your trust in what Christ has done. Right? This is what it means to be a Christian, to turn away and to reject a life lived against God and to rely fully on Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Apart from Christ, you will bear the guilt of your sins yourself. Right? If you will not rely on Christ, then you reject the only way of salvation that God has provided. Right? Be warned, there is no other name for salvation other than Christ. So turn to Him. 
for how else will you be ready to face a holy God? Now for the Christian. Leviticus also has a wealth of application. Uh, Leviticus, first of all, is an opportunity to be filled with awe at the holiness of God and to be thankful for His grace in Christ. Uh, it is books like Leviticus that should empower Christians to live a life of worship in gratitude to God for Christ. Right? An ungrateful, grumbling Christian is a contradiction in terms. Right? No matter how low life brings you and how little you feel that you have to thank God for, Leviticus will always give you a reason to thank God with grateful thanks. Right? Thankfulness in the Christian is grounded not on our material condition, but being confronted with the sinfulness of sin, the reality of God's wrath against it, and then the grace of God in His Son. Thanklessness, therefore, in the Christian is of deep concern. Right? Have you forgotten the Gospel? Studying and preaching Leviticus is also a safeguard for us against taking God's holiness and our sin lightly. Uh, Leviticus forces you to see that God's holiness is real and our sin is real, right? As real as Nadab and Abihu, uh, their dead bodies on the floor in the tent of meeting, right? It's as real as the slit throats of the bulls and goats and the blood that is spattered on the altar. Now on one level, as Christians, we have no excuse not to have God's holiness and our sin as something that's very serious to us, right? We have the cross of Christ, but hard-hearted as we are, the familiarity with the cross sometimes dulls us to these realities. And so Leviticus is an opportunity to be reawakened to these realities, right? As you read Leviticus, picture the death, smell the blood, smell the smoke from the dead bodies of the animals being burnt as the sacrifices. Or imagine attending the funeral of Nadab and Abihu. Right? Don't let God's holiness and your sin just be concepts in a book. Right? And as you begin to take God's holiness and your sin seriously, it will protect you against the foolishness of thinking that in some way you can contribute to your salvation. Right? The only way to believe in salvation by works is to make God less holy and to make yourself less sinful. Right? Only then does earning your salvation make sense. Right? It's like trying to pass an exam by lowering the passing mark. Instead, preach and teach clearly the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, and you will guard yourself and your hearers against earning salvation by works. Right? In your evangelism, don't hold back from telling people how surpassingly holy God is and how terribly sinful they are. Right? This is the way that true faith in Christ is produced. It begins with despair at the hopelessness of our condition in sin, and then it turns to joy at God's grace in Christ. Now, not only must we preach this gospel to non-Christians, but we must preach this gospel to ourselves. Right? Let me ask you, when you have sinned, how do you deal with it? Right? Are you tempted like me to lower the standards of God's holiness? Right, to bargain and reason and fudge so that God is not so holy? Right? Are you tempted like me to make your sin not so bad and give yourself excuses and blame other people for it? Now Leviticus cuts across this foolishness and it confronts us with a God who is so holy He can't even dwell among His own people without endangering their lives. Right? God is so unbearably holy that the right response to Him as a sinner without Christ is total despair and hopelessness. So when you have sinned, brother and sister, stop hiding from your sin, stop hiding from God like Adam did. Instead, be confronted with the holiness of God and the sinfulness of your sin, such that you are forced to flee once again to Christ, to throw yourself upon His mercy and to rely only on His death for your forgiveness. See, Christ, the perfect sacrifice, has made full and final atonement for the sins of His people. Access to God is now open, so approach God with confidence. It was 4 verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you have sinned, right, preach the gospel to yourself. Do not despise the work of Christ by making less 
of God's holiness and your sin. Now finally, I trust that our time in Leviticus has uh, convinced you of the need to study and to teach and to preach the Old Testament. So Christian, let me say to you, you need the Old Testament. Right? Stop treating it as a second-class book. Right? It is God's gracious revelation of His salvation so that when Christ finally came, we can appreciate Him and His work. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 All Scripture is, God, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Almighty God, we praise you for your glorious grace in Christ. As we behold your holiness and our sin, we are filled with thankfulness for the sacrifice of your Son, right? his broken body, so that atonement might be made for our sin. And we rejoice in the confidence that we now have to approach your throne, and we long for the day when our faith will become sight, as we gather with all your saints around your throne. We pray, Father, that you would forgive us for the times that we have made light of your holiness and our sin and for despising Christ's death on the cross. Convict us again of our sin and your righteousness and fill us with the joy of being yours. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now Hebrews 10, 25 tells us to consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. So I've prepared some reflection questions for you to discuss with your brothers and sisters in growth groups. Uh, if you're not part of a growth group, then you can find a group to join on our website and get in touch with the leader to join the discussion online. Here are the questions for your discussions.